Can everybody hear me? Amen. Wow. What a wonderful time in the presence of God to know Him and to be known by Him. And it's exciting. Things are happening in our place up north, just a few hours from here. God is just touching our community and stirring it up. And I like stirring stuff up and uh, stir it up and then say bye. It's time to go somewhere else. <laughs> no, uh, God is working. Our little sanctuary there is beginning to fill up and with many different lives from many different walks of life. And we're excited uh, for those lives that are being touched. We're being watched on 13 nations around the world through the YouTube stuff that we do, and it's exciting. Uh, I told you last time I was here, we planted a new church in uh, Mindanao, in the city of Cagayan de Oro, Pilgrim Congregational Church of Cagayan de Oro. And the first three weeks that they were open, 32 people got saved. And so we're really excited about that, and we were able to send some money to purchase a piece of property, and things are getting good all over the world. There's a team there right now, and they just had a wonderful women's conference. And so you pray for us as God will continue to just open doors and do what God wants to do. This evening, if I read correctly what the theme was for uh, this month, I, I'm trying to be close to it. <laughs> My theme tonight is loving God and serving man. Loving God and serving man. And what I want to say to you tonight, I want to say in three stages. Stage one, two, and three. When I get to stage three, you know I'm done. <laughs> Amen? There's a story in the scriptures. Whenever Jesus wanted to communicate truth, he always told stories. Some were parables. Some were human stories. Uh, some were uh, very touching stories. Others were very troubling stories. And evidently there was a problem going on among the people that were even following him. Uh, you remember in one of the incidents in the New Testament, the Bible says that uh, when the crowd gathered and they had to feed them, one of the disciples said, send them away, send them away. We, we don't have enough to feed these people. And Jesus said, don't send them away, feed them. And so it shook them up. How are we going to feed all these people? Well, in Luke, the 10th chapter, verses 30 through 37, we have another incident where Jesus begins to illustrate what it means to love God with all your heart and to have a passion for reaching out on his behalf. It's the story of the Good Samaritan. You've read it many times. Uh, you've read through it, and so many times we read through things and kind of miss uh, various different aspects of it. I like to call it my three-stage presentation. Let's start at verse 30. Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among the thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. The story opens up as a man is leaving Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which is the, uh, the city of God, if you will. Jerusalem, the place where you went to worship God. The place where, and he might have been one of the pilgrims that had gone up for the mighty celebration, for they had many celebrations that went on in Jerusalem. Four times a year, all the men in Israel had to gather in Jerusalem to worship God. And this might have been one of those occasions. And then the Bible tells us that as he went down, it's significant that it says down, because Jerusalem is high up in the mountain, and Jericho was way down in the valley. And since he left this particular city, the Bible doesn't tell us what kind of man he was. The Bible doesn't tell us if he was a Jewish man, a Samaritan man, if he was an African man, if he was a European man. The Bible just says a certain man. And this man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He might have been traveling home. Who nobody, nobody really knows. And then he had an event happen to him that would forever change his life. We all have events like that, things that happen into our lives that, that revolutionize our lives, that change our lives, that, that cause us to view life different than we've ever viewed it before. One moment you're, you're, you're going in one direction and the next thing you know your whole world is kind of tossed up and you don't realize uh, you know, what, what in the world has happened. How come this has happened at this particular time? The Bible says that he fell among the thieves. 
Somehow, as he's going across, and if you know anything at all about that region of the world, uh, there was, the hills were always full of thieves. The hills were full of people just waiting for the travelers because there was always an exchange of money going on between cities and caravans carrying money and all of that. He fell among the thieves. What a terrible thing to fall into despair. What a terrible thing to fall and be surrounded by individuals who are coming to steal from you and not necessarily to help you out. The Bible says he fell among the thieves, the robbers, the, the ones that had come down upon him. And then the scripture describes for us what this moment was like. He fell among the thieves. He was stripped and he was wounded. And they literally took his clothing from him and they departed and they left him half dead. We've all met individuals like that who have, for whatever reason, have come into situations that they were successful one moment and the next moment the bottom has fallen out and there's nothing left to stand on. He couldn't have anticipated this. It just simply, the Bible says it came upon him and they left them half dead. The world is full of individuals or incidents that would like to leave us half dead. Even if we've been walking with God and talking with God and, and enjoying the presence of God, it seems that we could be walking on the highway of God and the next thing we could be laying on the highway of God, wounded by life. Well, life has a way sometimes of bringing deep wounds, bring, bringing severe wounds. The Bible says that, uh, you know, he was just, just left there half dead. You could imagine him laying there bleeding half to death on the roadside wondering, is anybody going to come along and take an interest in me? Am I going to die out here, out in this, in this road, leading nowhere, if you will? Isn't there anybody that's going to come by and touch my life? All these things that come through your life. Who's going to help me through this tragedy? Who's going to see me through the event that's happened in my life? Over 43 years of ministry, I have watched people go through many devastations. Some that have lost their homes with fires. Others that have lost children that have died from, from diseases or, or car accidents. I, I pray with many parents and I pray with many uh, mothers and fathers concerning different situations that have come into their life. And who could have imagined that it would happen to them? And often the question is, raised, how, why did this happen to me? It is a question that cannot be answered. It is a question that only sovereignty knows. He is a sovereign God, and he knows exactly what he's going to do in that moment in your history. Now, somehow, when I look at this story, the scripture says this in verse 31, and now by chance. It seems almost a phrase out of place. Now by chance. Well, we know from reading the scripture that nothing happens by chance. But it's choice of words. Now, by chance. It's just like, you know, uh, it never should have happened this way. This, these people that he's going to encounter probably would have never been on that road had it not been for the sovereignty of God that ordained that certain people would come into the life of this man. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. Now, notice what it says. And he saw him and he passed by on the other side. Came by, this man that had just left Jerusalem. Somebody said or translated it as the high priest. The one that had just been in Jerusalem, in the temple, worshiping God, loving God, telling God how much God was to him and how much he loved God, making sacrifices. And the Bible said he came upon this man and he saw him. When he saw him, the implication is that, he, I mean, he's looking at this man. He's broken, he's bruised, he's bleeding. He needs help. He needs for somebody to reach out. We used to sing the song, they poured in the oil and the wine, the kind that restoreth thy soul. They saw him laying on the Jericho road and they poured in the oil and the wine. But here was this religious man a leader of Israel, one who should have had much compassion in his heart. When I think about this man, I think about some of the ministries that I know and you are aware and I am aware who have no compassion for the broken, 
They can only perceive what is going on in their world. I think we've allowed ourselves, especially in the Western world, to become so mighty and so religious, if you will, that we can identify with brokenness. We can see it. We can observe it, but somehow we don't want to dirty our hands with that. Oh, it's one thing to preach that God is a God of compassion. It is another thing to engage in the act of compassion. The religious leader of a nation, the one who should have set the example, the one who should have said, let me get down here. It doesn't matter that my high priest garments are getting bloody and dirty. Let me put you on my animal and carry you. But the Bible says when he saw him, he perceived him. He understood what his situation is. And yet the Bible says he passed by on the other side. That phrase struck me. It comes up several times in the passage of Scripture. He passed by on the other side. How could you look at a broken humanity and pass by on the other side and call yourself a leader in the body of Christ? I've seen it many times where people were more concerned to elevate themselves and not identify with brokenness. Hello? Not identify with, with the needs that are around unconcerned, send them somewhere else. Let somebody else take care of them. We don't want our pews dirty. Hello? I remember when I went to California and I preached in a church. It was a beautiful church. Nice, comfort. And later on I was told that the reason that cho the, the children from the projects were no longer welcome there was because they didn't behave in church. They ran buses to get these kids to come in. What do you expect from kids in the project that don't go to church, never been in church, been cursed at all their lives, been slapped around, been smacked down, been made to feel like nothing, and then you bring them into this house of God and you expect them to sit like your little religious children. Hello? I so you know what? They stopped running the buses and sold the buses so they wouldn't have to identify with these children. You know what happened? God gave us a heart and a passion for those kids. We went into that project. We went on their property. We, we used their, their facility. In fact, they supplied all the material for us when, when they knew we were going in. And we taught those kids for nearly one year. And for one year, not one single crime took place. And that project, because we brought the presence of God to them, we weren't hiding from them in our four walls. They passed by on the other side. We have too many leaders today who are passing by on the other side. They want the clean crowd. The giving crowd. Hello? The crowd that's going to make them look good. Don't let them sit in the front. Sit them in the back. They're dirty. They're unclean. They're unkept. Now, the Bible also goes on to say, he passed by on the other side. Look at verse 32. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at that place, came and looked and pass by on the other side. See, there's one of the great men of God that many years ago was killed in a, in a plane crash. He was an awesome evangelist. He wrote great songs. I like his song about manna burgers and all of that. Keith Green was probably one of the most loving men that you could have ever met. He was a soul winner. He was a great musician, wrote great music, and gave most of it away. He wasn't out to get a buck from somebody. He was, how can I touch your life? How can I impact your life? How can my music make a difference in your life? The Levite, the celebrator, the man who had just come from the temple of God, worshiping and praising and jumping and doing whatever the Israelis did to worship God. Here was a celebrator of God who should have been full of compassion of God. But somehow, when he looked upon this man, 
I don't want to get my choir robe dirty. <laughs> don't want no blood spots on my choir robe. They might not be able to get it out. So much arrogance that goes on in the body of Christ once you get a little bit of success. When, you were, when, they, were, uh, when they were known, unknown, and, and the back hills of, of somewhere, when nobody knew them and they were just happy playing their, their little piano in church and barely could write a song or two, now they become so mighty and powerful that they don't have time for the broken. They don't have time to stop. They don't have time to recollect what it was like to be on the other side. Hello? You pass by on the other side. How could that be? You're a lover of God. You're a celebrator of God. But how can you miss the greatest blessing of your life? You pass by on the other side. I think we have too much passing by on the other side in the body of Christ. I think we have a lot of, of, lot of stuff that, you know, I remember once preaching in a church, a large, large church. Good friend of mine's. And I preached in his church, and I, I told it uh, from his pulpit. I said, look at you, how successful you are. This massive, beautiful sanctuary. You're sitting, you, 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 your pews are so padded, you could almost fall asleep on them. You're driving all these high-powered cars, and you got great success. But how many of you remember when you were in the ghetto, living in the projects, and you had nothing, and you had to stand in line in some soup line to be able? I mean, I was telling it that morning, you know, and, and you, could, you could see it in there faces. I said, some of you have your beautiful cars and you drove to, car, to church with empty cars right by the projects that you came out of. Hello? Brokenness. That's why I like going on the mission field. Ask Dr. Yeager what it's like to look in the face of a little boy, a little girl. I, 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 it, it just breaks your heart. You, you want to give away everything you have to be able to touch their lives and to make a difference. I believe the body of Christ has to stop passing by the other side. We've had too much passing out, passing by on the other side. Too much of thinking only of how can we be successful and be known and not enough humility, not enough brokenness, not enough touching human lives, not enough of reach, and we expect them to come to us, but are we going to them? This church that I was telling you about, very great, powerful church, this pastor, he was pastoring in this community, a large college community, and he actually was kicked out of one, one church because his Sunday school got bigger than the morning service. <laughs> so they asked him to leave. So he went across town with six people, mostly his family. He ran in a little storefront, rat infested, had to clean it up. Little heater, if you will. Yeah. Remember the little heaters? <laughs> yeah. And they went in there and he began to preach the gospel. And six turned to 12 and 12 turned to 20 and 20 turned to 100. They were able to build a small sanctuary and worship in that. He started a daycare in that little storefront right across the street from the projects. He never forgot where he came from. In fact, daycare during the day, church service at night, it worked perfect. Today, his church is over 3,000 members. And they still never have forgotten. Every single day, they open their doors and they feed the elderly a beautiful first-class meal cooked by chefs, not just line cooks, chefs who every day diligently feed all in that region, the elderly, because they know there's a need. Hello? What happens when our hearts, when we, 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 we are confronted by situations? Can we pass by on the other side? Aren't our hearts move somehow to say, God, what can I do? How can I change that? Hallelujah. Does it touch our lives when we read that the elderly people in some parts of our country are eating dog food and cat food because they can't afford to have real food in their medication? 
Does it, does somehow, does it, does it cause us to be broken before God and say, oh God, what have we come to in our nation that we can neglect and abuse and hurt? We don't want them around. Are you still with me tonight? Listen, I like the next verse. But a certain Samaritan, But a certain Samaritan. What did the woman say in John 4 and 9? Then she then said the woman of Samaria unto him, to Jesus, How is it that thou being a Jew hast drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria, number one, for the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Total stranger. He didn't claim to be a high priest. He didn't claim to be a, a Levite, a celebrator. He was just a certain Samaritan who somehow began to do what the church should have done. Oh, Lord, help me. I know this is going up there, but I, I think they need to hear it because the church has gotten where we have allowed others to do what God has commissioned us to do. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. When did we see you hungry, Jesus? When you stopped to feed me. When did you go? When did, you, when, when did we see you in prison when you came to visit me? When did you take care of the widows when we reached out to them and touched them? We have a lady that comes to our church. I recently found out that she had been orphaned all of her life. Could you imagine? No family. Stuck in a assisted living place with no family. One of the men that landed there brings her to church. A couple of weeks ago, she asked me, she said, can I become a member of your church? I said, sweetie, I'm working on it. You know, and she comes and, and she got a little walker and she can't barely get, get by. She can't hardly do anything. She mumbles at you. She said, can, can, can I be a part of the choir? <laughs> so, and she wanted a robe, and so we gave her a robe. We don't let her climb the platform because she might get hurt. So she sits on the front row. When the choir stands up, she stands up, and she opens her hymn book, and she mumbles through the words. But in that moment, she feels accepted. Not rejected by the body of Christ. Not thrown out. Not go down to the other church where, they, where you know, we, we don't want you around. You're too much trouble. But, you know, we have to watch you because you might trip, you might fall. No, we've opened up our doors. Amen. The good Samaritan, a stranger. I'm telling you, there's a lot of strangers in the world that are touching the lives we should be touching. There's a lot of Samaritans. There's the cults. There's the drug dealer. There's that abusive husband. Somehow all of that that's going on is touching lives and doing what the church should be doing. We forgot the go ye. <laughs> As we say, you go. We forgot what Jesus has spoken to us. The Bible said he came where he was. See, see, the thing is, you're never going to touch human need till you come where human need is. Until you, he said he came where he was. He didn't say to the man, if you come up to where I'm at, he came to where he was. In order to do that, he had to break out of his comfort zone. Ask David Wilkerson, Phillipsburg, Pennsylvania, if you've ever been to that little town, it's just a quaint little nice town. And he had a nice little church that he was pastoring in this little country atmosphere in Pennsylvania. What more could you want? A comfort, comfortable ch church with a comfortable congregation. And God throws that newspaper in his face. And he reads about these boys in New York City that had just beat a, a paraplegic to death. He could have closed that. He said, that doesn't, that's over there in New York City. Why should I get involved? 
Why should I even think about that? That's so many hundreds of miles from where I live. But no, he got in his automobile and he made his way to New York City. In fact, he was thrown out of the courtroom when he marched into the courtroom with his Bible. They thought he had a gun inside there and the police just surrounded him and it made the, the newspapers of New York City. Preacher comes, you know, waving his Bible and preaching Jesus to these young men that were facing death. That is how Teen Challenge started. I remember him telling how when God was moving in his life tremendously, just like Catherine Coleman, he said busloads of people used to come to Phillipsburg, busloads for his miracle services. He would pray and all kinds of, he said, and then one time in New York City, he was up on a rooftop overlooking the city. And when he got up on that rooftop, he found an addict who had overdosed on drugs. He still had the needle in his arm, and he was as dead as a doornail. And it changed his whole entire ministry. From that point on, that became his mission. How many addicts can I rescue? How many addicts can I? Oh, he could have went, run back to Phillipsburg. He said, but I'm doing good. I'm doing my crusades. Crowds are coming from everywhere. But he was the good Samaritan that said, I see more than I need to see. Sometimes God lets you see more than you think you need to see in order to get you motivated. What's going to motivate the body of Christ? He came where he was. Can't hide in our facilities to go where they're at. I happened to had the privilege of preaching a maximum security in the Philippines in a prison. We baptized in that prison 35 prisoners giving their hearts to Christ and wanted to be baptized. We started a Bible school in that prison. We send them special t-shirts that said, Angel Perez Ministry, Bible School Student. And only the ones that had that t-shirt could come to that class. They asked for it. They asked the warden if they could have a Bible school. We supplied what they needed because their hearts were crying out. I have a little note. I still got it. I'm going to frame it. It was given to me by one of those prisoners. He said, Sir... Can you help us? We don't have access to soap to wash ourselves. Can you see that we get some bars of soap? Immediately, we mobilized and got them all kinds of soap so they could wash. Their prisons were not like our prisons. Some of those prisoners had to wear the same clothes they went into prison till they got out of prison. It was the most pitiful prison I've ever been in my life. All they were asking for was a little bit of soap. How could you not be moved? How could that not break your heart to want to go out and touch them? He said, the Samaritan, he came where he was. You won't see those kinds of needs in our sanctuary. You won't see those kinds of needs in our high-powered churches. You won't see those kinds of needs until you get out of the sanctuary and hit the brick. That's what the great ministry in L Los Angeles is all about. They've hit the bricks. They're touching the lives of people that nobody else is touching. They're going down into areas where, where nobody else dares to go. I remember the old bishop in New York City invited some preachers once to come to Harlem to the soul-saving station for the nations. He said, y'all come on Friday night. That's the hot night. <laughs> you had to know the bishop. And they said, well, 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 do we come in the daytime? He said, no, 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 no. He said, we don't even start till 8, and we just worship till about 11 or 12, and then we get our fishing clothes on, and we go out into Harlem about midnight, and we go knocking on doors, and we go on the streets with the broken and the, and the addicts and the destroyed, and we just go, he said, we go fishing, and we reel them in. Amen. Hallelujah. And they said, well, why can't we do that in the daytime? 
He said, when would you rather die, the daytime or the nighttime? Ten matters, Harlem. <laughs> but somehow we're intimidated by names, Harlem, East L.A. We're intimidated by situation. I couldn't go on the east side. Certain neighborhoods intimidate our heart. How can we evangelize them? You know how you can do it? You take a, a, a man who has a vision to start a Sunday school in one of the worst ghettos in New York City, Bill Wilson. He goes there. He gives his whole entire life there. He starts reaching children. He has Saturday Sunday school for them. And he gets 100 and 200 and 300 and 400 and five. He has thousands of kids now coming. Those kids that he reached are now reached the and they are teaching classes and they have a great church because one man said, I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to touch somebody's life. I'm going to be that Samaritan. He came near. And when he saw him, see, coming near is only one part. When you come near, you have to perceive the need. You have to understand what is going on. You have to begin to understand what has happened to this man. And the third part of that, the Bible says he had compassion. Compassion. He, he drew near and the sting within him rose up. The, somehow a brokenness came into him. He, he, he didn't know what to do with himself except to reach out into compassion. Compassion is never forgetting where we came from. I have, in the last years of my ministry, I've spent a lot of time with addicts and, and working with addicts and alcoholics and, and being a counselor and doing all of those things and having seminars. And I keep being reminded, don't ever forget where you came from, boy came from the South Bronx, strung out on drugs, broken. Your life was going nowhere. They told you you would die in a heroin attic. But now 43 years later, I've been free. God has kept me free. And God has always reminded me, don't ever forget the price of freedom. What it feels like to be free. What it feels like to lay down and not worry that somebody's going to kick your door in and take you off the prison. Don't ever forget that feeling. Don't ever forget that feeling of what your body feels like when, when you don't have your drugs and, and you're craving and you're nervous and you got pain and you're going through stuff. Don't ever forget. You were at the bottom. Compassion. I told you several years ago when I came with a little boy that came up to us in the Philippines. In fact, we had two incidents that day. I will never forget the one lady, there was this one young lady, she was about 12 or 13 years old, beautiful Filipino teenager with raggedy, I mean raggedy clothes, barely enough clothes to cover her body, living under a cardboard box. And we got there to, with the food to feed them, they were all ready to eat. That was where I had my incident with the little boy that kept sneaking up on me. See, broken people, they sneak up on you because they're afraid you're going to reject them. Broken people don't run up to you and throw their arms around you and say, hi! Broken people come, come crawling up in their brokenness and asking questions or, or poking at you to see how you're going to react. And this little boy, I will always remember him. From where that man is with the camera, to where I am right now, I could smell him. As he got closer, it opened up my nostrils. That's how bad he smelled. And when he got close enough, I thought, I'm going to pass out. But you know what? As he got closer, he kept inching up. And he's grinning. Half his teeth are missing. He must have been about eight, eight, nine years old. Teeth missing. Oh, God, he smelled bad. But he's inching up, he's grinning. I'm thinking if he gets any closer, I'll pass out. But not only did he get close, he came and threw his arms around me. I 
Angel, do you love Jesus? Oh, Lord, you know I love you. Thou knowest that I love you. Can you hold that little boy? Lord, you know I love you. Can you hug this little boy? And I held him in my arms. And this is the thought that came to my mind. I wonder when was the last time somebody held that little boy in their arms and told him, I love you. I wonder when was the last time somebody grabbed this little boy and said, oh, you smell like death. But I'm willing to touch your life. That little girl that was barely clothed, one of my workers was so moved with compassion, she ran back to the hotel room and em emptied her closet, emptied her suitcase, and came and gave her all of her clothes. Say, here, put this on. It, it kind of covers up some of what's hanging out. Compassion. I stood, I told you about the miracle of the multiplication of the food in our last feeding in the Philippines. Fifty kids waiting in line in the bucket. It's empty. Oh, God. So what do we do? I start praying over the bucket. God, multiply the food in the bucket. God, multiply the food in the bucket. And every time she scraped it, you could hear the bottom of the bucket. And she kept pouring. All 50 kids got fed. Because God doesn't know not how to minister with great compassion. If you have faith and believe, he will answer. Can you reach out and touch? Can you understand? Can you know? Can you feel? He, the Bible says he was moved with this great yearning. Oh, you know what's missing in the body of Christ? The great yearning. The great yearning to see our altars full, not of the same church people every week, but the great yearning to see our altars full of broken lives. Lives that nobody cared for. Lives that people are despising. But somehow the body of Christ has said, come. I remember once <laughs> the drunkard that cussed me in church. If you've never had that experience, get ready. <laughs> he stumbled in off the streets. I was preaching in Jersey City. And he stumbled in off the streets, as drunk as can be, came right up to the front, sat down. He's preaching as much as I'm preaching. You know how the old drunks do. I gave an altar call and he came. And I laid my hands on him and I asked God to touch his life and he got instantly sober. And when he got instantly sober, he cussed me good. He said, I spent all morning trying to get drunk. <laughs> I spent all my money what am I going to do now? I said, you're going to accept Jesus. That's what you're going to do. You're going to let God transform your life. You're going to let Jesus make a difference in your life. See, we've got to get ready for Jesus to make a difference in the lives that we don't think we could touch or that, that anybody's interested in. The church in America is disinterested in the broken, the disenfranchised, and those that cannot help them pay their bills. Hello? They're only interested in those that can come and make a great contribution. But what about those that have nothing? broken, been beat up on from life. The Bible says he has this yearning. Listen, verse 34. So he went to him. See, see, that's personal involvement. He saw him. He had compassion. But having compassion is not enough. He went to him. I could have looked on that little boy and said, keep your distance. You know what it's like to hold a young teenage boy and a young teenage girl? Boys... He was 16, the girl was 15, and a four-month-old baby. Just children themselves. And I asked, what's, what's the deal? He said, well, I'll tell you what the deal is. This baby was born on the streets because this mother and this father have no place to live. 
They were street kids. Now they had a child. I could not imagine, oh God, how, how could a, a four-month-old baby be starving half to death and nobody care? Nobody reaching out, nobody saying, what can we do to strengthen you? Scraping, going in the garbage cans, standing in front of the hotel windows with their noses up against the windows, saying, feed me. You can't know what that's like till you've been there. Can't know what it's like to, to be eating your breakfast and, and see these little faces with their noses pressed up against the window. You got to stop eating. You got to start buying bread and, and getting whatever you can. See, somehow in America, we've got to get back our compassion and we have got to reach out. We've got to get some involvement. He went to him. And he bound up his wounds and poured in the oil and the wine and set him on his own animal and brought him to an end. That's personal care. That means it's going to cost you something to get personally involved in compassion. It's going to cost you something to personally get involved in touching somebody's life. In Cincinnati, years ago, the director of the Teen Challenge there was literally stoned to death by a gang of boys in an open lot. He was there taking pictures. And they came upon him, and they literally beat him to death. And unbeknownst to them, all of that was caught on the camera because the camera was on all the time. So they got arrested. And they were taken off awaiting trial. And his wife was left with two children, beautiful children. And you know what? This woman who had just lost her husband to these gang kids, she went to visit them and minister to them. Somehow she got the courage to say, you took away the thing that I loved. But that cannot stop me from having compassion. Praying that God would have mercy upon you. Praying that somehow God would reach into your lives and you would see what has occurred. Personal involvement. Where is the personal involvement of the body of Christ in broken human need? When is, what's it going to take for us? To not only look on the need, but to participate in healing the need. If they can't come to you, what do you do? You go to them. It's interesting. Recently, I started going with a team down to one of the assisted living places in our community. And we asked if we could have a service there periodically for the people that were there. And you know what that nurse told me? She said, the only person that comes here, he comes once a week to serve communion to the, the Catholics that are here is the Catholic priest. We have never had a Protestant church come here and preach the gospel. I'm thinking, that building's been there forever. Those people have been there forever. Why hasn't somebody caught the vision and said, let's go and do it? I still contend that the most neglected people in the body of Christ are the shut-ins. The forgotten ones. But somehow nobody reaches out to because they're not there present in the building. He put him on his own animal. That means it was cost to him. It's going to cost us something, body of Christ, to be able to engage people and touch their lives because many of the broken are not going to come to us. Many of the broken are so broken that unless we reach out our hands to them and lift them up out of their despair, they will die in their despair. They will die in their brokenness. Addicts aren't running to our doors. Alcoholics are not running to our doors. Better women are not running to our doors. 
that means that we have to run to their doors. Finding them. I think it was past the 12, they used to go to Baltimore and, and, and give out food and, and do the, the different things that need to be done. Listen, the body of Christ has failed the people of America because we have enjoyed our little presence and have grown massive sanctuaries while whole entire cities are being devastated by the enemy. Whole entire cities. Just today in our newspaper, it has become one of the heroin capitals. Our region, Wilkes-Barre Square, one of the heroin capitals of this country. It's so cheap you can get it for $3 a bag and $4 a bag. Flood it with drugs. And my thought is, God, what are we doing to reach out and touch them? Like the telephone thing, reach out and touch them. That's what Jesus is grabbing us by the hand. Reach out and touch them. See what they smell like. See how they act. See how they'll cuss you. See how they'll despise you and reject you. But touch them. Because if you touch them sooner or later, one of them is going to run back like the leper that ran back to Jesus and said, thank you, Lord, for reaching out and making a difference in my life. Let's pray. Jesus, huh? oh God. Father, tonight, we don't want to be a good field church. We don't want to be a church that consume with ourselves. We want to be a church that is consumed by human need. Open our eyes, Lord, not only that we may see Jesus, but we may see the condition of our cities, the condition of our neighborhoods, the condition of our neighbors, the condition of the elderly, the condition of the sick, the condition of those that are broken by life. Tonight, teach us a new level of compassion, Jesus. We would step out of our world into that broken world. Lord, those that are watching and listening to my voice, I pray that a deep conviction would fall upon them and they would be motivated to move outside the sanctuary to where human need is all around them. I thank you for those that are gathered here. I pray that the Holy Spirit would touch their lives. I pray that in this moment, each one of us would pray, Father, for a touch of your compassion, for, for a move of your Holy Spirit within us. God, mold us and break us and do whatever it takes. We want to be like Jesus, who took time, Lord, to, to, to pray with the lepers, who took time to, to raise the child from the dead for the, mother, uh, the widowed mother, who, who took time for people. May we make people more important than our ego trips. May we allow you to show us once again how to have compassion for people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You need to ask him that tonight. God, reveal your hand of compassion to us. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.